carbohydrates. Uh, perhaps I haven't made this point uh, clear, or perhaps I have. I'm not sure. But carbohydrates are pretty amazing things. Uh, at least that's what I think. Because that's what I studied. Um, what do I have there? I say it's the most structurally complex system of biomolecular homologs. Uh, homologs meaning similar chemical structures uh, within the same family. Uh, homologs is, is sort of a chemical family. So carbohydrates are the most structurally complex system of biomolecular homologs uh, that we know of naturally occurring on Earth. So uh, what are some? What do I mean by this? Well, uh, carbohydrates can vary by residue. Um, so here I'm showing you galactopyranose, which has that axial uh, OH at C4, and gluco, which has the equatorial. Uh, in the very beginning of this unit, I started uh, off with one of those, the, the hexose tree that showed the whole tree of different carbohydrates um, by, uh, sorted by the stereochemistry at each of the carbons. All right? So those are all uh, examples, and this is this is just one example of, of two different residues that you can have. Uh, we can have different isomers. So uh, here is L versus D glucopyranose. Um, and this, these are non-superimposable mirror images of one another. So you can have L or D sugars. Turns out that the majority, about 90 Eight percent of sugars in the natural world, probably actually much higher than that, are D. Uh, but there are some L sugars out there. Um, uh, the anomeric configuration, which is also just a stereochemical uh, uh, distinction, uh, but specifically at C1. Uh, the C1 carbon can be either axial or equatorial, uh, giving you alpha or beta uh, structure. So here's glucose in both, and you have alpha in red and, and beta in blue. Uh, ring form. So we can have uh, pyrano rings that are six-membered, or we can have furano rings that are five-membered. Both of those uh, structures in front of you are uh, glucose. Both of them are beta-D-glucose. But uh, one of them is beta D glucopyranose, and one of them is beta D glucofuranose. They are um, the connectivity and the stereochemistry of those two molecules is identical, except for the fact that in one of them, the hemiacetal uh, formed between uh, C1 and C5, and then the uh, that's the glucopyranose, and the other, the hemiacetal formed between C1. And C4, that's the glucofuranose. All right, so there's ring form. And then there's linkages. So I talked about allolactose, that was the beta 1, 4. Or no, I'm sorry, allolactose is beta 1, 6. And lactose, which was beta 1, 4. Lactose, milk sugar, and allolactose was the effector of the lac operon that turned on the genes in E. coli that enabled babies to absorb lactose. All right. So you can have all kinds of different linkages. You can have alpha or beta. You can have linkages at uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, carbon 6 in the pyrano form. So there's an amazing amount of structural diversity. Let me put this in context for you. Um, nucleic acids, A, T, G, and C, DNA, there are four bases. So that means if we were to look at... Uh, a tetranucleotide, a tetranucleotide, that is a four-member uh, polymer or oligomer, because uh, it's short, a four-membered oligomer of nucleic acids, uh, a tetranucleotide, uh, that, would give in, that would give you uh, how many unique uh, tetranucleotides would there be? Well, there'd be four to the fourth power. That's 256 uh, unique tetramers. Um, what about proteins? Well, there are 20 amino acids. What, how many possible tetrapeptides would there be? That's just four amino acids. Uh, how many possible tetrapeptides can we make um, with the 20 amino acids? Well, that's 20 to the fourth power. That's 160,000. 
So now let's just uh, let's consider saccharides and only considering the naturally occurring D aldohexoses, no L sugars. There are seven of them. Uh, naturally occur, and there are there are uh, D aldohexoses that are not naturally occurring, but uh, only the ones that actually fo are found in nature. Uh, the naturally occurring D ketohexoses. There are four of those. One of them being fructose, uh, ketose sugar. And the possible linkage sites at C2, 3, 4, and 6. There's four of those. Anomeric configuration, alpha or beta. Aldohexose ring forms, pyrino or furano. And uh, any of the naturally occurring D aldopentoses, the five carbon sugars. There's four of those with three possible linkage sites. So that gives us that long uh, arithmetic equation to the fourth power which is 796 million different tetrasaccharides. Just linear, not branched. Linear uh, tetrasaccharides. Uh, almost 1 billion of them. And then, if you were to consider the possibility of branching, which uh, is possible and does uh, happen, is very common. Uh, one of the branching uh, things we, we talked about, have we talked about pectin in here yet? Amylopectin? No, maybe I'm going to talk about it today. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, well we're going to see it. There's a branch, there's branching in that, for example. That makes the possible tetramers, dust tetramers, uh, 10 to the, on the order of 10 to the 17th. 10, that's a 1 with 17 or zeros, a 10 with 17 zeros after it. No, 1 with 17 zeros after it. Okay, so an unbelievable amount of structural diversity is possible in carbohydrates, far more than I think people uh, appreciate. What does this mean? Well, here is uh, an, an actual non-food uh, scientist. Most of the people I've shown you have had something marginally to do with it. This guy uh, is Louis Sullivan, and I take uh, every opportunity to talk about him. I find him to be pretty fascinating. He is an architect who was the first person to, uh, he's built the first skyscraper, which is in St. Louis. Anyone been to St. Louis, to the arc, the arch, gateway to the west? Well, um, if you were to stand right where you, uh, that perspective on that building there, which is the, the uh, first skyscraper, if you were to turn around 180 degrees, you'd see the uh, arch. Um, so whoever took that picture had the arch to their back. Um, and why am I putting this guy up here? Well, he was the first to articulate the uh, notion of structure and function. And I'm going to just read you a quote from one of his buildings, uh, one of his books, I'm sorry, The Tall Office Building Artistically Considered, published in 1896. Uh, it is the pervading law of all things organic and inorganic, of all things physical and metaphysical, of all things human and all things superhuman, of all true manifestations of the head, of the heart, of the soul, that the life is recognizable in its expression, that form ever follows function. This is the law. He was uh, a devout student, or um, not actual student, but a devout follower uh, uh, of um, Darwin. And, uh, you know, Darwin, when he published The Voyage of the Beagle in the early uh, 19th century, The Descent of Man, and um, uh, all of his publications, he, these ideas swept through the intellectual circles in all realms. Uh, and it certainly impacted this guy. So he wasn't just talking about a building here. He was talking about things organic and inorganic. Uh, and so this was the first time that ever, anybody ever uh, made the correlation between structure and function. The basic notion here is that the structure of something uh, is going to dictate its function. Or perhaps the other way, the function that, uh, a stru uh, that something needs to serve is going to be reflected in the structure that you see. Okay, um, this doesn't seem like that revolutionary an idea, perhaps, to you, because it's become so profoundly ingrained in our understanding. In, in the, we take it for granted; it's implicit in our understanding of the world nowadays. But this was a pretty radical idea at the time. Um, and one area that this had a profound impact on was uh, biology and structural biology. In particular. So uh, biochemistry and uh, 
the, the understanding of what the structure is of all these molecules. When I sh talk about proteins, I show you these complex ribbon diagrams. You're like, why am I showing, why am I seeing this? I can't really interpret that. Well, uh, <clears throat> it's because that structure on deep inspection will give you uh, a deep understanding of the function of uh, that molecule. So let's, let's think about this in the context of what I opened the lecture with, talking about the profound structural diversity uh, in carbohydrates. If there's that ama amazing degree of possible structural diversity, uh, then perhaps there's going to be a profound degree of functional diversity in carbohydrates as well. So what I'm going to try to do is get you to think outside of the uh, carbohydrate as um, just a fuel, just a source of energy. This is far more than that. Of course, importantly, it is that. Uh, it is a, a source of energy storage and release in terms of glucose, uh, glycogen, which is animal starch, and then amylose, which is vegetable starch. Uh, but it also serves structural functions. Uh, these are intrinsic functions to the carbohydrates. These are functions that are, are implicit in uh, their fundamental uh, structure. So uh, cellulose and cell wall uh, constituents or um, uh, biological structure elements, extracellular matrix, so outside of cells there are often complex glycan uh, things that do relate to food science because, um, for example, a pectin is, is one of them. Uh, we often use a lot of these um, structural components as important uh, constituents of food, and we'll talk about that a bit today. Uh, they are also important in the organization of membranes. Different glycolipids and glycoproteins help organize the microdomains on, a, on the surface of a cell. Um, they modify uh, the properties of other biomolecules. So, for example, uh, they can enhance protein solubility and stability. Perhaps there's a protein. I told you when we were talking about protein structure, there's a hydrophobic core and a hydrophilic uh, surface. But sometimes there are hydrophobic pockets that stick out uh, that can uh, destabilize a protein or make it less soluble. And uh, having uh, a what's called a glycosyl portion or a carbohydrate portion that's been attached to a protein, uh, like you see in the, in the cartoon there, uh, that can help the protein stay in solution because carbohydrates are so eminently soluble. Uh, they change the characteristics of various lipids, glycolipids. Um, of course, they're part of DNA and RNA. Uh, the ribo ring is in both of those. Uh, there are aspects of carbohydrates in various coenzymes, which we'll talk about what those even mean. Uh, these are essentially the vitamins uh, that we eat. Uh, they mediate solid gel transitions, which is a little bit uh, more complicated discussion when you talk about what it actually means to be in solution. But, um, and then they're also important in this notion of dynamic solvent perturbation. And I highlight this one because I find this one particularly underappreciated even by most biochemists. And it's uh, profoundly important. I think when the, the real importance of uh, this is understood uh, there will be a, a similar revolution uh, in bioscience around glycoscience, uh, around carbohydrate science, as there has been in protein and nucleic acid. Uh, this, this notion was put forward by this Canadian guy, really sweet man named Raymond Lemieux, uh, who died uh, right before I, I, uh, I guess while I was in graduate school, um, or right as I was going to graduate school. Uh, and the basic notion here is that you have these, you know, I, you see a glycoprotein on the left with the, this complex carbohydrate attached to it. And that carbohydrate is able to sample a whole bunch of com, uh, conformations in space, right? There's like very, carbohydrates are very flexible. These glycosidic linkages are very flexible and can move around and, and, and sample different uh, regions of space on different time scales. And, um, and that's what you see going left to right. I sort of rearranged it. As these carbohydrates are in solution, they're ordering the water around it or perturbing, perturbing the bulk water around it. 
and uh, as it changes that, there is a certain pattern or signature to the, the perturbation of the water uh, surrounding that, that carbohydrate. That is how a sugar encodes information uh, in the solvent and can allow different binding partners to come together. It allows inter interfacial interactions. Um, I'm not going to go into that too much more because it's, it's kind of tangential to food science, but it's very important. Uh, then there are a lot of extrinsic functions to carbohydrates, uh, cell sorting, cell-cell uh, signaling, uh, mediating cell adhesion, uh, and then aspects of uh, the ad adaptive and innate immune system, uh, all of which are beyond the scope of this class. So I highlighted here the functions that are particularly relevant to food uh, science, food and no nutrition. Of course, energy storage and release. Yeah, that's, that's our bailiwick here. Um, also, uh, biological structural elements. Um, and there are aspects to dynamic uh, solvent perturbation that uh, you, you will see are important to food science uh, in a bit, if I'm able to tell my whole story today. All right. So let's look at some of these uh, larger... Uh, sugars. We call them complex carbohydrates um, because they are more complex. They have uh, more than just a couple uh, sugar residues in, in them. Some of them are truly enormous, have uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands, uh, in some cases millions of sugar uh, units in, in the same macromolecule. Uh, polysaccharide is a long chain of monosaccharide units. So what are some of the categories of polysaccharides? Well, there are storage polysaccharides. Um, and these serve as uh, energy reservoirs for um, anything that's alive, plants and animals. Um, plants make two types. Uh, and, uh, and we call them starches, uh, these energy uh, Storage molecules are starches in plants. They make two types. Uh, amylose is the first. Uh, and we find amylose, for example, in, in foods like rice, potatoes, bananas, uh, etc. Um, they have this amylose. And amylose is real easy. It's just a single repeating chain of glucose alpha 1 4 linked to glucose. All right, so a long chain of them. And this monstrosity of a, of a, of a, yoga torture device that I have in front of you here is a tetramer of amylose. That's a four residue segment of uh, amylose. And I have it wrapped around uh, that yoga bolster there because the specific linkage, that, uh, that alpha 1,4 linkage, because of the geometry of that and because it's repeating uh, one after another without variation, it ends up being a spiral. It's not a perfectly linear uh, linkage. It ends up being a spiral. If you take a closer look at that thing there, you'll see that there's a very regular, I tried to, I tried to set it up before class, there's a very regular repeating pattern of hydrogen bonding between each of the hydroxyl groups uh, in that molecule that helps stabilize that uh, spiral form. Um, the spiral that you see there, uh, the yoga bolster, this is going to be important on Friday because uh, we're going to make a, do a test for starch in our uh, Halloween candy. And uh, right where the blue yoga bolster is, is going to be iodine molecules right down the middle. And it'll cause a color change that will tell us that uh, amylose is present in the sample. All right. So here is a... Uh, a picture, uh, an electron micrograph, uh, of what a starch granule, a crystal of this stuff would look like. All right. The second type, uh, which is just a variation on the theme, is amylopectin. It's, a, it's also a starch, uh, and it's a starch that has these glucose, alpha-1,4 glucose re repeat units that go on long, long chains of them. However... Uh, some of these chains are attached to one another uh, in a branching pattern, and that branch linkage 
uh, can't be an alpha 1 4 because the 4 is taken is occupied uh, within the main chain of uh, amylose so we have an alpha 1 6 uh, linkage alpha 1 6 glycosidic linkage which I when, when I was talking about allolactose I talked about the extreme flexibility of that linkage. And it makes sense that this would be a, a good branching uh, linkage uh, in this context. So every 25 or 30 residues along uh, the chain of uh, amylose, you have an alpha-1-6 linkage with another strand of amylose coming off. We call this amylopectin or pectin. This is uh, the stuff that we used last week uh, to make jelly. All right. So let's, let's compare uh, these two and actually talk about a little bit about what we did last week. Uh, by the way, uh, not last week, two weeks ago. By the way, I don't know if you guys paid attention to this last week in lab, but everybody who made jelly and stuck it in the fridge, that jelly is solid now, and you are welcome to take it home and use it, whatever. It took some time to, uh, to, to congeal, but it's, it's, all, it's all good um, if people want to take some jelly home. It's in the fridge there. If not, I'm going to take it home. Um, so <clears throat> starch in general is, uh, when it's dehydrated in, the, in this dehydrated form, which is uh, typically what you find in, in plants, um, it's extremely difficult to digest and break down, all right? But when we take a uh, sample of starch, a potato or something like that, uh, or the, uh, the, gra the grapes that, um, or apples or whatever uh, that have the amylopectin in it, when you begin to cook them, you hydrate uh, the starch. So if you, uh, and this allows them to be digestible and allows the proteins to get in there and hydrolyze those alpha-1,4 and alpha-1,6 linkages. So on the bottom, uh, you see uh, gelatinization. On the left is, in panel A, is a dehydrated uh, pectin molecule. And then we put it in the water and we, we cook it up with some uh, warm water. And it hydrates and the water sort of pulls it apart. And uh, it's going to allow that, it's going to break a lot of the hydrogen bonds that are formed in this molecule that you see in front of you here, uh, though, because the water is going to interpose itself between these intermolecular hydrogen bonds. And, uh, and then those, um, those strands of uh, amylose are going to be able to cross-link and, and hydrogen bond between one another. Uh, be across strands rather than within the same strand. Yeah, Damon. Um, does the same things happen to like when you're farming oil on the uh, Yeah, so whatever starch is in a corn, is in corn, is getting hydrated and uh, it, it breaks down, which is why corn that's cooked often tastes a little bit sweeter than corn that it is not. Um, yep, yep, same thing happens. Yeah, the starch that's in corn gets hydrated and broken down. There is an amylopectin in corn. Uh, corn has amylose, so unbranched uh, chains of it. But, um, so, and you see here uh, on, on the right-hand side in, in the yellow, uh, you have amylose, which is just a big spiral. You see the, the spiral of sugar residues uh, around the, the phantom tube that goes down the middle, much uh, like identical to what I've tried to build with the model in the front. And then uh, amylopectin is the same thing, except it has the alpha-1,6 branches that come off of it. So this is the difference between potato starch on the left and, uh, you know, maybe grape starch or fruit starch on the right-hand side. All right, so uh, what, what do we do with this stuff uh, once we've hydrated it? How do we actually digest it? Um, it is digested using a protein called amylase. Uh, amylase is a protein uh, that is able to hydrolyze the uh, alpha, the gluc alpha 1,4 gluc linkage, the glycosidic linkage. So uh, amylose uh, can come in and, or amylase can come in and snip off little disaccharides off the long amylose chain. And that gift that you see up there in the corner 
is showing that happening. We start with a long uh, chain of starch or amylose and amylase comes in and is snipping off little disaccharides uh, that uh, can be absorbed by the body and then broken down further. Um, amylopectin needs a special set of enzymes, however, because the amylase can, can chew up all the amylose strands, all the 1,4 linkages, but when you get uh, to the 1,6 linkage, uh, you got to have a special enzyme to hydrolyze that 1,6 linkage. And there's a, a, actually a wide variety of those. There's a lot of diversity uh, in, uh, in the types of proteins that will hydrolyze a 1,6 linkage. Uh, so I didn't go into those in detail. Um, anyways, um, after you have amylase and the, and the debranching enzymes breaking down uh, the starch, into shorter saccharides called dextrins, uh, amylase can continue its work until uh, those dextrins or short chains of, uh, of uh, starch. Like So for example, what I have on the bolster would rightly be called a dextrin. This would be a dextrin, called, considered a dextrin. It's not long enough to be amylose or a starch. It's a short fragment of it, so you'd call that a dextrin. Um, and dextrins are common components of a lot of food products. If you look at a lot of processed food, you'll, you'll see some kind of dextrin that has been added. It's just a form of sugar, a little bit uh, more resistant sugar, a sugar that's going to take, not going to like spike your blood sugar the same way uh, just taking uh, sucrose might. It's going to take a little bit longer for your body to process a dextrin than it would, but it's still just sugar. Um, once it gets it down to a disaccharide, the disaccharide uh, would be a glucose, alpha-1,4 glucose disaccharide. That is what we call maltose. So uh, has anyone ever had a malted milkshake before? Or uh, it's Halloween, those malted, uh, what are the malted chocolate balls called? Whoppers. Whoppers, thank you. Yeah, those, uh, has anyone had a Whopper before? And You know that weird sort of chalky kind of oddly sweet flavor in those things. Um, that is what maltose tastes like. That is pure maltose. All right, And it's just this same animal starch disaccharide. Uh, you need a special enzyme to cut uh, that maltose in half to make uh, glucose for the blood. In fact, it would, we'd all be much healthier if uh, I don't know, much healthier, but we'd be marginally healthier if all of our candy was made out of maltose rather than sucrose um, because we wouldn't have the same fructose burden on the body that sucrose gives us. Glucose could go straight to the blood, to all the organs, but we'll get there anyways. Um, questions on that? Amylase. Amylase, debranching enzymes, maltase uh, breaks down the disaccharide. Okay, uh, so here's just a, a diagram of what amylase looks like. It's so uh, there's a no, your body makes a bunch of different amylases. Uh, the amylase is pretty much the first enzyme that your body makes to help in digestion. And where do you think that happens? It's a good guess, but not correct. And any other guesses? What do you say? Yeah, salivary amylase. Salivary amylase is one of the enzymes that's produced by the salivary glands, the parotid gland that's up here that feels kind of weird when you suck on a lemon. You ever get that weird feeling up here? That's your parotid gland shivering. Uh, and then you have your submandibular and sublingual uh, salivary glands underneath the angle of your jaw. Uh, they produce salivary amylase that helps to break sugars down in the mouth. Sometimes when you eat a lot of uh, candy or something really, really sweet, uh, you get that kind of gross, ropey, mucousy saliva in the back of your throat. That's the action of amylase working on those sugars uh, in the mouth and creating this like really viscous saliva. All right, and what we see here is just uh, the active site. Uh, this, the, the blue line is just the backbone of the uh, peptide, uh, of, the, of the protein, protein backbone. Uh, and then they have uh, the, a, a four, essentially what I have here, no, this is a five sugar, one, two, three, four, five. 
that's a five sugar uh, fragment just embedded in the active site. And you can see there the glycosidic linkage that's highlighted in red along the yellow there. That is the glycosidic linkage that's going to get cleaved. Um, and it's going to release that two sugar fragment to the left there. Um, and because of the way the, uh, the amylose uh, binds into the amylase, it bends that sugar uh, chain in such a way that it makes cleaving that glycosidic bond really easy. It makes it really easy. It just takes that spiral and bends the end of it off as it binds itself into that pocket and exposes that uh, glycosidic linkage to the, uh, to the asp uh, aspartic acid and the glutamic acid on uh, the bottom left-hand uh, corner there, which are going to catalyze the hydrolysis of that glycosidic linkage. So this is how amylase works. <laughs> Who knew you'd be getting to look at that? All right, so now we're leaving the, the world of plants for a moment. And uh, we're going to talk about glycogen. And glycogen um, is really no different than amylopectin. It's, it's not really very much different, um, except the only difference is rather than 20, every 25 to 30 residues along the uh, the uh, starch chain, there's going to be a, a 1, 6 branch. Instead of 25 to 30, it's going to be every 8 to 12. All right. <clears throat> so glycogen is much more highly arborized, uh, arborized meaning branched, uh, than amylopectin is. Um, uh, glycogen is stored in, in two tissue compartments in the body. The first is uh, in the liver. And the uh, glycogen that's stored in the liver is uh, mostly there uh, to keep your blood sugar stable in between meals. Importantly, uh, when you are sleeping and, uh, and after or during intense exercise. All right. Uh, but it's mostly uh, uh, for when you're sleeping. So the other compartment, other tissue compartment for, uh, that you find glycogen in is uh, in muscles. Muscles store an enormous amount of glycogen as well, muscle cells. Uh, and this is, this is the source of uh, glucose for uh, aerobic metabolism. Say so you're going to run, uh, go for a 45-minute or longer jog, uh, you, you are going to burn most of your glycogen reserves uh, or 45-minute cross-country ski, you're going to burn a lot of that uh, glycogen that's been stored in your, your muscle cells. Um, and you see a picture of it here. There's uh, all of these, um, these polymers of glycogen uh, that are attached to a central core protein. The, the protein itself is called glycogenin. Uh, don't let the name fool you. It is a protein. Um, and it's just, it just acts as the anchor point. Uh, for all these large uh, sugar chains that get attached uh, to the surface of it. Um, so here I have uh, a, a depiction comparing amylose, the linear chain of like potato starch, uh, to amylopectin, which is fruit starch, uh, to glycogen, which would be animal starch that would be stored in the liver or the muscles. Okay, so this is, this is how sugar is stored uh, on earth in things that are alive. Okay. Um, next, we're going to move on to structural uh, carbohydrates, structural polysaccharides. So we talked about storage polysaccharides previously, ways of storing energy in the form of glucose. Uh, and then we're going to talk about structural ones. And these fall into two categories. Another word for structural uh, uh, polysaccharide in the nutritional science world is fiber. That's what we call it, fiber, all right? Uh, the biochemists call it structural polysaccharides. The uh, food scientists call it fiber. And there are two uh, general categories. There's soluble and insoluble fiber. You've probably all heard these terms before, may not uh, have a very good idea of what they are, but I'll try to do my best in the next 10 minutes here that I have. So, um, Fiber is a carbohydrate that your body cannot digest, and it's not going to get assimilated. You're not going to be absorbing those carbohydrates 
for sugar and, and energy, all right? Um, but it does have similar uh, properties to some of the storage polysaccharides that we talked about. It will attract water. Like any carbohydrate, it's going to be sol highly soluble and like to uh, interact with water. Um, and it can form a gel-like uh, consistency when it becomes highly hydrated. Uh, that gel-like consistency in uh, fiber tends to uh, go into the GI tract um, where it's going to get hydrated and it can, that gel uh, helps with a whole host of aspects of digestion. It can help uh, ease passage of, uh, of the, the food bolus through your uh, GI tract. Uh, can have profound impacts on the types of nutrients that are being absorbed, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to go through the two types, soluble and insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber, as the name would imply, this is one, this is fiber that is going to go into solution. So if you had a solution of soluble fiber, uh, it would uh, not settle out with time. <coughs> Hello. A little spike on the audio. Sneeze right into my computer. Um, it uh, is able to be fermented in the colon, and uh, soluble fiber tends to be the fiber that leads to a lot of uh, gas, the the non-smelly gas the, uh, that uh, the bacteria in our gut can produce. And uh, it's also the source of a lot of really important physiologically active byproducts uh, that we'll get to talk about a little bit. Uh, it also uh, can delay uh, gastric emptying. What I mean by gastric emptying, I mean the emptying of the stomach into the intestine, all right? So if you have a lot of soluble fiber, uh, it's going to take longer for that food to uh, complete its process of digestion in the stomach uh, and before moving into the small intestine, into the duodenum. And uh, that in turn is going to make you feel fuller longer. The more uh, soluble fiber you have, the greater the sense of satiety, uh, satiety that you have, the sense of, of not being hungry. So if you have a lot of soluble fiber in your diet, uh, you're, you're not going to feel as hungry uh, soon, as soon as someone who has a very low fiber content in their diet because the food will reside in the stomach longer and it'll, it'll take longer for the food to, to break down. Uh, insoluble fiber. Uh, as the name also uh, would suggest, it is... Uh, not soluble in water. And it is profoundly metabolically inert. Uh, this means that it's not really fermentable. Um, so the soluble fibers are things that bacteria are able to consume, although we're not really consuming. Bacteria can consume and ferment those sugars uh, for whatever byproducts they have. Um, but uh, the insoluble fiber is not. And this uh, provides purely bulk, purely bulk. Um, so it also can lead to a sense of fullness that is not translating into uh, actual uh, absorbed calories. Yes, Patty. What do you mean by bulk? Um, so you, it's, it's volume of food that's going to cause uh, distension in the stomach that is going to trigger stretch receptors that are going to make you feel full. Uh, but is not going to um, actually contribute to absorbed calories in any way. It's also going to uh, form more volume in uh, the bolus of food that is becoming feces as it moves through your GI tract and is going to give uh, the intestine something to, to work on, the muscles in the intestine something to work on, all right, uh, which is important. Yeah. So, so it's important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, get get as much fiber in your diet as you can. Yeah, fi be become a those guys the uh, the two guys. I kind of slammed them a little bit in that one podcast about what was the podcast? Those two dudes they were just talking about. Uh, yeah, the vegan the vegan athlete dudes. They were like fiber 
uh, fanatics. And like I, I don't have any point of contention with them there. Fiber is an excellent thing to be conscious about in your diet, even at uh, a young a young age. It will have a lot of uh, impacts, uh, immediate impacts on your health, and also long term uh, impacts on your health if you uh, have a high fiber diet. Uh, so <clears throat> it's also able to absorb water as it moves through uh, the GI tract, and as that happens. Uh, it's going to be, become hydrated. As that happens, that's going to make a defecation uh, easier. And who doesn't like uh, an easy defecation? So um, I have some examples there uh, of soluble and insoluble fiber. Barley. Has anybody had barley soup before? You know how barley soup gets that kind of a little bit uh, slimy is probably not the most appealing word. But you know what I'm talking about, that kind of uh, mucinous uh, kind of gel in, in the barley soup that's similar uh, to oatmeal if you have highly cooked oatmeal or like steel cut oats if you ever had those um, or oat groats, uh, that same sort of like uh, semi-opaque gooey uh, stuff. That's, that's the soluble fiber. Uh, beans also produce this. So if you have like bean soup, you know how it gets that kind of thick broth around it. That's a lot of the soluble fiber. Uh, in, in that figs, uh, prunes, sweet potatoes, all of these uh, foods have uh, are excellent sources of soluble fiber. Uh, and then uh, the other cereal grains, uh, whole wheat, lentils, uh, apples, even avocados are excellent sources of insoluble fiber. Strawberry diet. Who was talking about the Kim Kardashian strawberry diet the other day? You guys. Well, she, she was getting plenty of bulk. Having easy defecations. Yes. So, I've seen that like on um, like a lot of food packaging, they'll say net carbs. Yeah. And they'll have like total carbs minus fiber mm -hmm. is the net carbs. So, can you like explain that math? Yeah. So the total carbohydrates is going to be the sugars, and then uh, the meaning like. Glucose, fructose, sucrose, maltose, any kind of dextrins, and any kind of starches. And then there's going to be the fibers, uh, which are the st uh, structural polysaccharides. All of them are carbohydrates. These ones are uh, calorically unavailable to you. So when they do that labeling, people are trying to like count caloric uh, carbs because that's going to relate to the impact on, the, on your glycemic load, like how your, what your blood sugar is. And so they're going to like subtract out all the structural polysaccharides, um, soluble and insoluble fibers, and that's going to give you the net amount of carbohydrates that are uh, available for, for glycemic purposes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So like none of none of these fibers translate into actual calories. Uh, no, not directly. Not not you're not going to absorb. You're not likely to absorb much glucose from them. That is not to say that all of the carbohydrates in oats or barley or beans are, it's, it's not, they're not pure fiber. Of course not. I mean, there's starch in all of those things as well. And so you will be absorbing calories when you eat those. I, I'm not uh, in, indicating that at all. But uh, there, are, there are plenty of, there's a lot of fiber in those, uh, those foods as well, which is important to consume. Any other questions with that? Okay couple more uh, fibers to go through here. Um, so we're gonna, I'm just going to give you some examples of some different types of uh, soluble fibers. Um, one of them is arabinoxylin. Uh, xylin. We call this a hemicellulose. And we call it a hemicellulose uh, because if you look down the middle of this molecule, you'll notice the, the glucopyranose chain. You see those six-membered uh, glucose rings that are beta-1,4 linked to one another in a long linear chain. That is cellulose. That is, that's what cellulose looks like, wood, right? But um, they call it hemicellulose because uh, it's not actually able to form the side-by-side -side sheets that glucose forms because it has... Uh, these weird xylins, these weird uh, pento sugars called uh, xylose, uh, pento, aldopentoses, alpha-1,3 linked 
uh, to the glucose along, along uh, every residue. Uh, and we find arabinose island uh, in certain uh, types of food, uh, this, uh, this stuff here called psyllium, um, and it is a, it's a, a grain fraction that is extremely high in uh, arabinose island. Uh, this, um, a lot of, you can buy this stuff, a lot of old uh, people, after a life of not paying attention to fiber, try to get on the fiber bandwagon, and they can buy this stuff at health food stores and chuck it over their cornflakes in the morning, or even more disgusting, they'll, they'll swirl it into a glass of water and, and drink it down. I think this stuff's called Metamucil. Um, and... Uh, it does a lot of things. It is going to lower the cholesterol and blood glucose uh, because it's going to inhibit uh, absorption of in the in the bowel of those. Uh, it's going to promote bowel function. Those two are actually related. Uh, so rather than absorbing absorbing uh, cholesterol and uh, some of the glucose from the starch, uh, you're going it's going to be passing along with this psyllium. Provide, provides lots of bulk for the body uh, that the intestines to work on. Uh, I think I have time for one more slide. Um, so here's another one called fructin. Um, uh, another category called fructin. And the fructins are a huge family. I, I could probably spend several, several lectures. I mean, you could probably build a graduate course around just talking about fructins. It's such a large uh, family. Um, but they... They have, they're all, they have similar motifs. Uh, here is one of the fructins. Uh, it's called inulin. And uh, one of the things about fructins is they have fructose in it. A lot of them are built off of uh, fructose repeats. Uh, so we see here uh, inulin is a repeating uh, beta-1,2 fructose chain. And every so often, there is a beta-1,2, no, I'm sorry, at the cap on the end of it is uh, a glucose-1,2 link to that uh, fructose. So uh, inulin is, is perhaps the simplest of the fructins. It's just a long chain of fructose uh, that has been capped uh, with a, a glucose molecule. And you find the fructones, uh, fructins in all kinds of different uh foods, not just uh, fruits. So uh, you, you can see artichokes, asparagus, barley, garlic, even onions, rye, uh, flour, wheat, um, and uh, semolina all have a reasonable uh, percentage of their bulk weight is made up of fructans. Right? So these are, for uh, those plants, they act as uh, structural polysaccharides uh, as well. All right, so uh, I have just a couple more slides before we're done with carbohydrates, and I'll finish that up, and then I'll start uh, the next unit, which I'm going to have to make today. Uh, but uh, I'll see you on Friday morning, and then laugh.